Well, we're following on from last week, last week being the first Sunday of the new year. Uh, we looked at the words in the first chapter, where, from verse 17, where Paul begins his prayer. He begins it in chapter 1, he finishes it in chapter 3. But that doesn't mean that it runs all the way from the middle of chapter 1 to the end of chapter 3. He kind of breaks off in the middle. So it's a prayer in two parts, but when we look at it, it's really one prayer, and it dovetails perfectly, beautifully, and wonderfully. We saw last week that the great reason that Paul is praying is that ultimately these Christians might grow, that they might become more mature in the faith, and that central to that is this matter of knowing Christ better. Again, I challenge you gently this morning, how do you measure growth in the Christian life? How do you do it? You might say, well, I've been a Christian for 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, however many years. Well, that's good. But the truth is you can be a Christian of 50 years standing and a recent convert can actually outstrip you in terms of maturity. You might say, well, I've, uh, not only have I been a Christian for a long time, but I've served the Lord in many areas. There's lots of things I've done in the life of the church and in other things, and that is so important as well. It is important to serve the Lord. But is that a great measure, ultimately, of Christian maturity and growth? Sadly, there are many in Christian service who, whose maturity is lacking, we have to say, spiritually. And we might look at other ways. You might think about the number of books you've read, the number of conferences you've been to, the number of hymns and songs you know, much theology you know, church history, all that sort of thing. But here Paul points to one great thing that Christian maturity is focused on. It is the degree of our own personal knowledge of Christ. And so let me ask you again this morning, how well do you know Jesus Christ? Again, that, that issue needs a little unpacking, doesn't it? For it's easy for us to be able to say, well, I know what the Bible says about him, that he is the Son of God. And that when he came into this world, we see one person and two natures. Those natures are distinct, but they're perfect. So he is absolutely God. He is absolutely man. You may be able to talk about his life, his ministry, may be able to talk about things like the Beatitudes, the Sermon on the Mount, about the miracles. You may even be able to talk about his death and resurrection. But how well do you know him? That question is what some would regard as an experiential question. It is a question which is asking us not only how much we know with our minds, but how well do we know the touch of Christ upon our hearts and upon our lives. Now you cannot look at Paul's prayer in Ephesians that begins in chapter 1 verse 17 and then, as I say, there's a little gap in chapter 2, and then he picks it up towards the end of chapter 3. You cannot read that prayer and think in terms of knowing Christ without the reality of considering the degree of your experience of Christ. Now, there are some people who will say, well, really, that's not very helpful, Phil, to be asking these kinds of questions. That's very... Um, Superficial, they might even say, or it's very emotional, or it's easy for us to mistake emotions for um, things that, well, they can be misleading, can't they? And yet we need to be faithful to Scripture. And we need to recognize that as necessary it is that our minds are filled with the Word of God and the truth of God, but so too are, are our hearts to be aware of who He is. We are to know not only about his works and ways, but we are to experience them in our lives. Now let me remind you that 
these two sections where we find Paul praying for his friends at Ephesus, interestingly, both begin with a little phrase. It's an identical phrase. You see it back in chapter 1, verse 15, <coughs> and we saw it this morning in chapter 3, verse 14. And it's a little phrase, for this reason, which connects Paul's prayer with what he has previously been saying. Interestingly, when you look at chapter 3, if you go to verse 1, you'll see that Paul begins in verse 1, for this reason, I, Paul, and then he kind of actually drifts, we think, into a glorious discursus, a, a, a kind of distraction. So when you get to verse 14 in chapter 3, he has to sort of pull himself back to talking about this prayer, and again, he prefixes it with the phrase, for this reason. We saw last week that there in chapter one, when he says, for this reason I'm praying for you, he's speaking about God's sovereign work in our salvation. And so we have these wonderful words. For example, prior to the beginning of that prayer in chapter one in verse four and five, for he chose us in him that is in Christ before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us to be adopted as his sons through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and his will. So Paul is now really saying, because this is true, because this is the fact of the matter, that he chose us in Christ before the creation of the world, he predestined us in love according to his pleasure and his will, I'm now praying you know him better. You know more and more and more of him in your life. And this, of course, leads Paul, as he prays that they might know him better, to remind us again also in chapter 1, verse 17, that we need the spirit of wisdom and revelation, for that is how you know him better. As we said last week, you don't have to go for a walk on Kevin Sheedon and look at the stars at night or a lovely sunset and get a funny feeling and say, now I know Christ better. You don't have to do that. You don't have to stare at a blank wall and let your mind go blank and somehow this stuff will come into your head. No, you need the spirit of wisdom and revelation. What is that? Well, Paul, I think, is speaking about the work of the Spirit in revealing who Christ is in his particular day to the Ephesians. You have to remember that he's writing to a young church that doesn't have the Bible that is in your hand right now. They have the Old Testament scriptures. They have these letters. There were fragments of the Gospels, or perhaps some of the Gospels were starting to appear, but they didn't have the whole canon of scripture. And so when we read these words, the spirit of wisdom and revelation, we are now ultimately pointed, I believe, to the scriptures. For it is through the scriptures that we see the, hear the wisdom of God, and those scriptures are, of course, the revelation of God. So how do you know Jesus better in this experiential way? Well, we can certainly say that it is not going to happen apart from the scriptures. The Lord may use other things as well as we're going to hear about this morning. Well now as we come into chapter three, that for this reason is again a kind of further development. And what Paul is praying for now is really a further development of God's work in our salvation. So he's now reflecting, I think, in chapter three, the, the, the prayer part we're going to look at this morning, the second part of his prayer. I think he's really reflecting on chapter two, or what we know as chapter two, which begins with the news that we were dead in trespasses and sins, but very soon moves in verses four and five, having pointed out our utter and complete inability before God, this wonderful news, but because of his great love for us, God who is rich in mercy made us alive in Christ. And this too is to stimulate our praying. And as well as that in chapter 2 we're shown that not only has God brought us into the knowledge of himself through his great love in and through Jesus Christ and the operation of his grace towards us in Christ and through Christ that we might come to this place of salvation. 
chapter 2, verse 10 shows us now as a result of this, we're God's workmanship. And all this has happened and we've been created in Christ Jesus to do good works. We're now to live for him, we're to shine for him wherever we are, in school, in college, in work, in the home, in your leisure, if you're on holiday or not, or whatever it is, we are constantly to shine for him. And these good works, whatever they may be, that God has ordained in your life, he has done it in a very deliberate way. Well, let's move on, shall we, and look at this part of the prayer in chapter 3. It is a development of his praying. In verse 16 of uh, chapter 3, we read, I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his Spirit in your inner being. In many ways, that seems to sum up this second part of Paul's prayer. He's concerned for these Ephesian Christians. He wants to see them living for Jesus with passion, with joy and delight. He wants to see them living sacrificially. He wants to see them living obediently before God and his word. And so he's praying that the Lord, out of his glorious riches out of the abundance of who he is, would strengthen these Christians with power through the Holy Spirit in their inner being. In those words again, he is driving us in this experiential direction. He wants something to happen to their inner being, the heart, the soul. And that something is that they may find their inner being strengthened with power through the Holy Spirit. And he acknowledges that only God can do this. So this is really prayer for the work of the Holy Spirit in the life of the believer. Paul is building on the desire that we may know Christ better in chapter 1 to now particularly being strengthened with power through the Holy Spirit in our inner being. Now it is very right to speak of the Holy Spirit in terms of power. The Scriptures does this again and again and again. And you may hear that commonly. People speak about the Spirit was moving in great power. Or you might read about it. And you say to yourself, well that sounds Very interesting, but the Bible always clarifies what that power is for. It is never power for power's sake. It is never power so that we might just simply feel something and be kind of encouraged. It is power to do something. It's not power that we might become impressive or power that we might be able to have things. Instead, it is power ultimately to know Christ better. That's the great direction of the Holy Spirit. His whole great work is to glorify the Son and to see the Son glorified in you more and more. And it is the power of the Holy Spirit that enables this and enables us to know him better. That's why in verse 18 of chapter 3, Paul's prayer includes asking for power together with all the saints to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And that really is his burden. You as a Christian and I as a Christian and the Christians everywhere that the Holy Spirit might so work within us in and through the word of God, the spirit of wisdom and revelation that we might be able to grasp the dimensions or something of the dimensions of the love of Christ. Now you might ask this morning, why do we need this power? It's an important question to ask because sometimes we can behave as if we don't need it. So I'm talking to you this morning about the love of God, essentially. And knowing it, you might say to me, well, can you recommend a book on this? Okay, that's fine, that's good, but you're not ultimately going to find what Paul is praying for here simply by reading a book. We need the power 
the Holy Spirit. Why is that? It is, friends, because of the hardness of our hearts. It is because of the spiritual blindness which we experience. It is because of our pride and our ignorance. We need the Spirit of God to melt our hearts and open <laughs> our eyes to God. Now Paul explained this back in chapter 2. As for you, you were dead in trespasses and sins and so on. And he spoke about the impossible position we were in before we came to know Christ. This is how you were when you used to live. And this is how you used to live when you followed the ways of the world, he writes. You say, well, I'm not like that anymore. I'm a Christian. Surely it's different now. Yes, but why is it different? It's different because of his grace in Christ and the work of his spirit within you. That's the reason it's different. It's not different because somehow you've worked stuff out. It's not different because you've, you've come and done Hope Explored or you've, you've had a good chat with somebody and the kind of feel you've now got things sorted in your mind. No, it's only different because the spirit of God is at work within you. Why is it today that you have a measure of joy in your heart as we were singing praise to God? Why is it today that there is a measure of hope as we read this passage within you? Why is there faith within you? And the answer is it's the grace of God and the work of the Holy Spirit within you. It's an amazing thing, isn't it? That's why Paul, I think, in Corinthians has to remind us that our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Now dwells within you as a Christian. But we still need the power of the Spirit. For we have the supply of the Spirit, but we have the Spirit by measure. That's an important theological concept, all right? So as a Christian, you have the supply of the Spirit, you're born again of the Spirit of God. The Spirit is there, but you have the Spirit in measure. There is only one person who ever had the Spirit without measure, and that was Jesus Christ. He did the miracles. He preached with authority. He was raised from the dead by and through the work of the Spirit. He had the Spirit without measure. You and I have it in measure. You know what a measure is? It's, it's a certain amount. A small measure, larger measure, whatever. And Paul's prayer here really is that we might have more of the work of the Holy Spirit within us, which will lead us to know Jesus Christ better. And that the better we know him, the more eager we are to serve him sacrificially and to shine for him before the darkness of our community. So we need this power. And all this Paul tells us in his prayer, the fact that we may have the Spirit of God, we may grow in measure, be filled with the fullness of God. All this is possible because, as he prays in chapter 2, verses 4 and 5, it's made possible by the death and resurrection of Jesus. So the Spirit of God must work within us if we are to mature as Christian believers. And we must never be afraid of this. Sometimes people have spoken about the Spirit of God and dear me, you, you hear some crazy things attributed to the Spirit of God that biblically cannot be attributed to the Spirit of God. And yet when you hear about them, you, you feel a bit nervous and that's fair enough, you should be. You should run away from that stuff. Years ago, it wasn't that long ago, used to hear people say, well, the Spirit of God fell and people were running around crazy, barking like dogs and falling on the floor and stuff like that. That's not the Spirit of God. I have no problem saying that to you this morning. That's a spirit of delusion. It's probably more to do with some psychological release within them. It's not the work of the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God always drives a boy, girl, man or woman ultimately in one direction, and that is to know the love of God in Jesus Christ. In fact, the greater the work, the Spirit of God within us, the more we desire to be less of ourselves and more like Jesus. And it is our greatest need today to know a deepening 
of the work of the Spirit of God. Well, central to the work of the Spirit of God, Paul wonderfully puts it here in chapter three, is about you and me knowing more of the love of God. And put your hand up right now if you don't want to know more of the love of God. I mean, you really do have to be uh, pretty, well, not in your right mind, don't you? We're not talking about a hard thing. That's the great thing. The Spirit of God is calling you and desiring and God desires to fill us with his Spirit that we might know something wonderful and glorious. He's not calling, the Spirit of God doesn't call us to, to, to some terrible state of austerity spiritually. No, it calls us to abundance and central to that abundance is the love of God. So we have these remarkable verses and we do have to acknowledge here this morning we really are on holy ground in these verses, and I think particularly in verses 18 and 19, that we may have power, that's through the Spirit, together with all the saints, that's not just the people at Ephesus, it's you and me, to grasp how wide and long and deep and high is the love of Christ. What an ambition, what a prayer to pray, what a desire, and then Paul is kind of lost in these words, in this, the reality of knowing the love of God. For he goes on to say, my prayer is also that you might know this love that surpasses knowledge. How in the world can you do something like that? How can you know something that surpasses knowledge? Think about that in a moment. And to be filled to the measure with the fullness of God. So we have the Spirit in measure. Paul's concerned so you might be filled to the brim and filled with joy and be overwhelmed by the knowledge of the love of God. Uh, and this is not some esoteric, mystical thing. Remember, friends, his eye is on our service, which is why the rest of the epistle is taken up with how we live as children of God in the world. He's gonna talk about things like how you bring up your children, how your marriage is conducted, how, how we go about living with the real nuts and bolts in this Christian life, how we're to understand working, the working world of being under authority or, or in work, having a position of power and authority, how that's to be used Christianly towards others. It is highly practical. But his great concern is that all this practical living should be driven by a deeper and growing, ever-growing knowledge of the love of God. So the love of God. D.A. Carson, American theologian, wrote a fascinating little book, The Difficult Doctrine of the Love of God. The Difficult Doctrine of the Love of God. It is. It's one of those things we can talk about. We sang about it, O love of God. How strong and true. Horatius Bonar in that hymn made some powerful observations about the love of God. But sometimes we can just talk of the love of God as if it's this stuff. There is nothing more practical in all of creation than the love of God. The love of God has been made manifest in Jesus Christ. And this is how we know God loves us. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. The love of God isn't some mystical thing. It's powerful. It's rooted in the real reality of God's works and ways in this world. So what can we say about the love of God and knowing it? Well, to say, first of all, it's never about earning it. Don't think that somehow by more effort as a Christian and more service and greater service and greater sacrifice that somehow as a result of this you'd be rewarded with a deeper knowledge of the love of God. Growing in the knowledge of the love of God is a work of the Holy Spirit within us. It's about knowing that he's loved us despite our best efforts. That the very best thing you can offer him is ultimately filthy in his eyes. We need his grace. We need his works. 
That's what Paul was reminding us in chapter one when he said he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love he predestined us. There is mystery in those words, but there is also great clarity. It is love that drives the predestining work of a sovereign God. It's not some cold, calculated, you're in, you're out, you're in, you're out. No, in love. And it was all in accordance with his pleasure and will. But we know God's love never by seeking to earn it. We know his love as the work of his sovereign spirit within us. And we need to be reassured this morning that he is inviting you to grow in the knowledge of his love. That's why Paul prays, I'm praying these people may grasp this. They may be given power through the Spirit to take hold of it, to grasp that this is not some little thing. And it isn't. Dear me, it isn't. To know that you're loved by Almighty God you know, we, we, we talk about this so freely, sometimes even flippantly, but it is the most staggering thing in all the world. Loved by Almighty God. And Paul's concern is that we may grasp this is not a small thing. No, he says, we need the Spirit of God to show us just how wide and long and high and deep is the love of God. So, so the love of God isn't just that you happen to be in that particular meeting and you heard about Jesus Christ and about his life, death and resurrection and how you could have new life through faith in him and faith alone in him. Well, that is an evidence of his love. Of course it is. But there's much more. And as you might open the lens of your life and you step back and you see, well, actually, how did I get to that meeting? Well, it was because someone in work talked to me about Jesus or a neighbor talked to me about Jesus. And well, how did that happen? And the lens goes wider and wider. And you say, well, what was it that caused us to, 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 to get that job in that department and to find myself right next to that person who's a Christian? Or, or what was it that caused us just to buy that house and it just happened that next door at the end of the street or whatever was a Christian? And you look back and you see, actually, that was God. It wasn't just that he took me to that meeting, but the whole trajectory of my life. And then you come to that amazing conclusion that it isn't just the path of my life, but he's been ordering everything and bringing everything conformed to his will and his purpose that you might know him. And you step back from your life into the mystery of God's word where he says ever before there was a creation of the world, he knew you. He loved you and he purposed you to have you as one of his children according to his pleasure and will. It is an amazing thing to know that you're loved by God. Some time ago, I was in the governor's meeting. They're always confidential, by the way, but I know I can tell you this bit. Yeah. There was a, a senior member of staff who'd been sent on um, a, a course to learn some new uh, area of theory and teaching and education and she said it was it was a, it was tough it was really stretching the mind and um, it was uh, it was hard going and she said well I think she was two or three days on this course and she said I got to the point where I think I'm beginning to understand this and uh, we were just finishing one day and they were staying overnight and we were going to be there the next morning and they the course directors said um, well we're going to choose a few people for tomorrow to actually put this into practice, everything they've learned. And she got chosen. And she said, oh dear, because this stuff is tough. And uh, she said, I didn't sleep very well. And there I was, and she said I was getting my notes ready. And she said, just before I spoke, this is an interesting thing. She said, I made a list of all the people I knew who loved me. She said, oh, there I was, I wrote about my mum, my dad, my sisters. I wrote about my husband, I wrote about friends. She said, I've just made a list. He said, All these people are on your side. And it was her little technique for getting through giving that demonstration. Do you know, I've often thought about that. Times when you feel a bit overwhelmed, 
to say, who are you? Who am I? Whatever I may be, the most important thing is that the maker of heaven and earth loves me. It's an incredible thing. It's an incredible thing to think that he knows about me. But he loves me. And the evidence of that love for me, he gave his son to Calvary. There is nothing greater to meditate on in the Christian life than the knowledge of God's love for you. And that's why Paul is praying this. Lord, help these people grasp this is not a small thing. And then he writes, help them to know this love that surpasses knowledge. And you might say, well, that's just double talk. How on earth can you know something that surpasses knowledge? What is Paul praying? I'll tell you what he's praying in our vernacular, in the language of our day and age. He's saying, Lord, blow the minds of these people with the knowledge of your love. Take them to the limits of human understanding, of the ability of the human brain to consider and let them feel that limitation and know that there is still so much more. You see, you are loved not just in this life. You are loved in eternity, from eternity to eternity. There is never, ever, ever going to be a moment when God, the triune God of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit ceases to love you. Through all eternity, He will love you. And as we sang in that hymn, that love of God on the one hand is old, consistent from eternity, but it is ever new. The love of God is the most remarkable thing. And this is what is to drive us as a church. As we go into this community with the good news of Jesus, this is what is to drive you to persevere in the situation God has placed you in work or in life. It is the love of God. The love of God towards you as a sinner. You know, we have no idea how downright offensive we were to God as sinners. Or you might say, I was brought up in a Christian home. Someone like myself, first words were God and Jesus. You have no idea how offensive I was to God. He is of purer eyes than even to look at sin. And yet, he has loved sinners. It's an amazing thing, isn't it? Perverse and foolish oft I strayed. And yet, in love, he sought me. And he sought you out. He knew about you before the foundation of the earth. And he sought you out in time and space. And he's brought you into his family. And eternally you shall be there. Loved by almighty God. Always loved. Even loved when you're in rebellion. He doesn't stop loving you. And it is because of that love he may chastise you. It is because of that love he may challenge you. It is because of his love to you he may bring you up short sometimes and remind you of the foolishness of your ways as a Christian, but he never stops loving you. The love of God is more wonderful than we can ever imagine. So Paul pushes us towards the need to know this and experience this. He said, this is the thing. This is the thing to set Ephesus alight. This is the thing to cause Christians to, to move way out of their comfort zones and to be willing to take huge risks for the work of the gospel based on the trajectory of the word of God. This is the thing which will snap people out of their indifference and their cold-heartedness and to spurn the things in this world and the pleasures of this world which are just for a season and to live for the things that are of eternal values. It is to be driven by the love of God. You see, this thing is far more than just producing knowledge within us, though it is rooted in knowledge. We need the Word of God to point us to the dimensions of God's love. But it's the kind of knowledge that produces something within us. And what is that? It's what we were telling the children this morning. Worship. Worship. It is. 
And worship is to be seen in so many ways, our desire to please him, to serve him, however that may be, being the very best person I can at my job, in the place where he's put me. One of the first things I learned as a Christian under the ministry of a very wise and godly man, he said years ago, you know, he had a complaint from a man who had a business who wasn't a Christian. And he said, I've got a couple of Christians in my business. He said, they're terrible workers. So what do you mean? Well, he said, they're always wanting to speak to people about Jesus or talk about the book they've read or what went on in church. And he said, I, I need them to get on with the work. And he said to me, don't ever be like that. God has placed you somewhere to do your work. It's an honorable calling. Do it to the glory of God. What should drive that? The love of God. And when you have opportunities to speak to others, let it be the love of God that drives you. I mentioned uh, on Thursday night during the week of prayer how easy it is in preaching to be self-indulgent, not actually serving people. How easy it is to go into our town center and start yelling your head off about the sins of our age and the sins of men and women and the need to be born again because somehow it's meeting a need in you rather than actually ministry. The most effective ministries are ministries driven by the love of God. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them, for they were like sheep without a shepherd. Compassion, love drives compassion. Love helps us seek things out to serve and to give of not only our time, but our energies, to be willing to say, my name, my reputation, let it be trampled underfoot for the good of others and the glory of God in their lives. There is so much more we can say about the love of God. But central to this is Paul's prayer. And I want to leave you with this here this morning. You see, his prayer isn't just for the Christians at Ephesus, though, of course, they are at the center of his initial thoughts. But there in verse 18, he writes, praying that we may have power together with all the saints, all Christians everywhere, throughout all the world, throughout all time. This is for all of us to be continually growing in the knowledge of the love of God, brought face to face regularly with the mysteries of God's sovereign grace towards us, the ordering of our lives, the amazing reality that there in Bethlehem 2,000 years ago, a Savior was born who lived amongst us and did not serve himself but served others and was willing to be despised and rejected by men, to be one whom men turn their faces away from, to be called a friend of sinners because he was hanging out with the wrong people. We need the word of God to point us to his words, profound and yet deeply simple as well. Whoever believes in me shall have a spring of living water springing up within them unto eternal life. Those are wonderful words, aren't they? It's the language of the love of God towards sinners. And in that wonderful word, one word, uttered in Aramaic, Mary. The language of the resurrection. He is alive. He has broken the power of sin. All of this comes to us from the love of God, and we are to grow in this. How do we grow in the love of God? As far time is far gone, we can't explore these things. But I want you to realize today, and we need to realize as a church, that we need more desire, more earnest prayer. Yes, of course, but. We're not praying to one who is reluctant. We're praying to one who is generous. One who is more willing to meet with us than we can imagine. But we do need to seek his face for a deeper awareness of that love of God which is so strong and true in Jesus Christ. So I pray very much for myself and for you and us as a church that this year, <laughs> 
whatever happens, whatever stuff we've got to do with the site over there, whatever we try to do as a church, however we grow, however we support one another through times of difficulty and grief or whatever it may be, that above everything, we grow in the knowledge of the love of God towards us in Jesus Christ. Don't be complacent. You've not arrived. You've only begun. However long you've been a Christian, there is so much more in Jesus Christ. And the Spirit of God might come upon us and reveal these things to us. Well, we're going to sing great hymn to